Um, I'm Angie Romer, and I'm the I am the current chair of the Johnson County Task Force on Aging. So welcome everyone. And this is our annual legislative forum where we have um, Bob, or excuse me, Barb Warning from Heritage Area Agency on Aging. She's going to start with some comments for us. Um, we have state reps, Dave Jacoby, Christina Bohannon and Mary Masher, and also our state Senator, um, Kevin Kinney. So we'll start with Barb. And then I'll come back and give you some of our pre-prepared questions. I know that Larry Coogee gave you the oil um, priorities. I think you all received a copy of that. So that's kind of what we're gonna center our questions on. But right now we'll start with Barb. Well, hi everyone. It's nice to see you. It's been a few months since I've sit in on this meeting. So I, I enjoy being here. Thank you for inviting me. I thought I would uh, just fill you in a little bit on what's going on both with heritage and also sort of around the state. Um, as you all know, um, we've, we've all received some uh, COVID and post COVID funding and we've been using that to really address our priority areas at, at Heritage in our seven county area, including Johnson County. Um, we um, uh, are in the first six months of our four year plan. So it was perfect timing in that regard to really look at our new initiatives. Um, first, we have expanded what we call our healthy homes project, which is there are components of this in every AAA around the state. It has to do with that strategy of aging in place and, uh, and aging well and healthy and in the community where you wish to age. Um, our Healthy Homes um, initiative really focuses on those people that we see in numbers increasing who have some environmental and health issues within their home that prohibit them from getting services in their home. And, and you know, quite specifically, this often has to do with um, hoarding issues, infestation issues, those kinds of things. We started to really notice an increase in this um, a couple of years ago and received some funding in another county to start a smaller project. And it's just grown now throughout the seven county area. And we're using some of our American Rescue Plan funds for that. Um, and so those folks that have situations that could require some home modifications within their home so that they can bring additional services in, they will be provided with that extra level of support. And it also, you know, we've also seen that complicated with the after effects of the derecho storm we had last year. And also it helps them to address social isolation because as that home becomes healthier, more people are going to be coming in both to provide services and, and honestly to visit. So it really is strategizing around some of those real key issues that we found um, that are increasing in the last few years. Um, we're also starting a project that I'm really excited about. It's called Iowa Return to Community. And we're the fifth of six triple A's to start this project in Iowa. It focuses on people over the age of 60 who are 300% or less of poverty and not in the Medicaid system yet. And we, we will be starting small. We will be starting with a couple healthcare providers in, um, in Cedar Rapids to begin with, but we hope to be branching out very quickly. And this, this pro program um, will focus on those folks that are ready for discharge and their healthcare provider believes that they're ready for discharge and can safely go home. And it will be providing a case manager to from our office to work with their medical provider, make sure we're clear on discharge instructions, make a home visit, make sure the home is healthy and ready for that discharge so that all of the plans can be implemented well and follow them then for six months. We're hiring soon um, a registered nurse that will be able to provide, not act necessarily as a medical provider, but act, act as what we call a health coach. And this program will be soon implemented throughout, like I said, throughout our area. We are able to serve um, hospital systems as well as um, uh, as well as well um, nursing homes. So again, we'll be starting small to get our feet wet and make sure we have the model and we're doing it well, but it really will help again with that whole idea of aging healthy, aging in place, and making sure that those people that are you know, hospitals call them frequent flyers, people that are in and out of the hospital frequently and just can't get that discharge to be healthy and clean and ready to go, um, help, helping them to go back home and stay home. 
And then finally, we, um, we received a grant with Iowa Department on Aging through, it's a federal grant um, through the ACL that is um, service, serving in the elder justice system. And uh, for those of you who are familiar, the child welfare system for a long time has used what they call the family team meeting philosophy. That is for certain cases where there's a founded child abuse or a situation that's very complex within the home, they gathered everybody together that was involved in that child's life. It might be teachers, neighbors, um, support, informal and formal support systems, friends, um, medical providers, everyone, parents, of course, grandparents that are part of that child's life and help to plan long-term supports to ensure that that child can stay out of the system. That's been a model that's just been used for child welfare for I think 20 oh. years. Now we're going, you didn't we have, have a grant. Faucet, did you? No, Excuse yeah, me yeah, just yeah. a minute. Um, now we thank you. Now we have um, this grant will be allowing us to take that model and apply it to people who uh, are in the um, dependent adult abuse area. And really the focus will be um, planning for those cases, working with them for long term supports and starting to identify within the community what supports work and what, what does not work to keep people out of the system. Again, just like return to community is identifying those folks that are at risk and keeping them safe and keeping them healthy and keeping them well. It's a two year grant. The first year we'll just be working with Iowa Department on Aging to be getting them some training established, write the manuals, get the criteria for entry into the system um, established. And then the second year, we'll be implementing these meetings and really studying the data to look at what supports work to keep um, older adults who have had some sort of a dependent abuse situation, keeping them out of the system. I love this grant because I worked in child welfare when they started the family team meeting philosophy a long time ago and I've seen it work and I've seen it work well. So I think it's just really exciting to take it now to the other end of the lifespan and look at dependent adult abuse and how we can really make a difference. For now it's a two year grant, but of course, if it works, it's something we're going to want to implement, not just here permanently, but around the state. So we'll be looking at the data and seeing if, it, if it's something that uh, gets our return and, and uh, evaluating from there within the next couple of years. So all of these program expansions mean we've hired a couple extra folks. We have actually two new people starting today. Um, one is a new elder rights case manager uh, because we are seeing more of those issues being needing to be addressed. And with some of these new grants and initiatives, we do look that we will need the extra staff power. So we've hired a new staff position there. We've also hired a new nutrition person to help us as we continue to expand our congregate meal sites and our voucher programs throughout the seven county area. So lots of good stuff happening at Heritage. Um, those are the kind of the high level um, reviews. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them, but um, good news, I think all around in terms of our capacity to serve more people and serve them well. What's your biggest day-to-day -day challenge, Barb? You know, like administratively, I think our biggest challenge is just not the unknown in terms of what every business I think is facing, you know, in terms of business unknowns. We certainly, like everyone else, we have we have hiring and capacity issues continually. Every employer does. But I think especially for nonprofits, it's not really knowing how to anticipate what needs will be there as we come through this pandemic. And I have a lot of friends who are executive directors of just all sorts of nonprofits. And we're all kind of experiencing that same thing is how do you plan for something that you've never experienced? I've been a, an executive director for decades and yet never seen these kinds of challenges. And you you want to serve and we do, you know, we're all seeing an influx of, of funding, which is great and needed. But then I think the challenge becomes as we increase our capacity, at some point we'll hit a cliff and that funding will be gone. 
And then it's ensuring that we have the resources to continue with these programs, because especially in our demographic, the need is only going to increase. So it's, it's planning for that, but yet not knowing how much it will increase and, in, and where it will increase and how. So it's, I sometimes compare it when I talk to my family about throwing a dart at a dartboard with your eyes closed. You know, you know that there's a goal there, but you just don't quite know exactly where it's going to be. Um, so that's a challenge. We also just anecdotally from our case managers and our employees, um, we definitely see the impact, I think, of the pandemic in that um, problems that are just more acute. Um, there was a hesitancy for a long time to ask for help in every part of the population, certainly in the over 60 population. And so as they are feeling more comfortable asking for help, often the, the problems are worse and it, it takes more resources. So, you know, there's, there's that piece too that, you know, frankly breaks your heart in a lot of ways, uh, just to see that, you know, a lot of people um, just didn't even feel comfortable asking, you know, even if they had contact for some of them, you know, they had contact with people, but just didn't feel like talking about the things they really need because they were just kind of hunkering down and trying to stay safe. Happy to take any other questions. Barb, we're also hearing that a number of businesses are doing outreach by just calling former clients and customers and checking in with them. And I look at that as good business practices and a good business model but they're identifying that a lot of those folks are just lonely and need that mental health um, service as well, just for somebody to talk to. And so I, again, I hope that more are, are looking at that and identifying that that's a real need within our communities, especially for folks who are isolated and may not have those regular contacts anymore. And, you know, during the, I say during the pandemic as though it's over and it certainly isn't, but, you know, during the, the, the times when we were really more locked down and unable to provide, because we are providing home visits now, but we really learned how much phone support you can give. And we had a lot of individuals that were getting weekly or more frequent phone calls, just, yeah, just to check in, um, Usually, if you talk for five minutes or more, you find out what's really on someone's mind. And so there was a lot of that. Um, and just, just knowing that somebody cares enough to give you a phone call. Our case managers were on the phone a lot. On the flip side, the social worker in me knows that there's no substitute for face-to-face. And that's why we, we did get our folks out as quickly as we can. And they are, they are out making home visits even now. But um, yeah, you're right. Phone support is, is so, so, so important. Any other questions? Barb, the other one is just support for all of you. I mm -hmm. think sometimes the caregivers and the people that are doing that um, they're providing a lot for other people, but the caregivers don't always get the support they need. Damn, and true. I know that's true with our teaching um, teachers and social workers and nurses and all of those folks right now, they need the support too. So if there are things that we can and could be doing to support you, let us know. Oh, and I appreciate that. And, and yes, that is really, you know, we certainly see that that's so true with all of their staff. You know, I've always really emphasized the importance of acknowledging compassion fatigue, but gosh, even during the, the derecho, you know, we saw our staff, you know, they had their roofs blown off too. And they were, you know, for one hour during the day, trying to get the insurance adjuster out to look at their home. And then for the next two hours, talking other people through the process, you know, and it, it was a lot, it was a lot. And we've, We've really encouraged our staff to sometimes, you know, just go, just put your phone down, put your, put your, close your laptop and just take 15 minutes for yourself, you know, when it just gets to be too much because it, it has been. And because I think a lot of the, um, a lot of the stories have been sadder than would be typical. And it's for the caring people that we all have on staff and they take it to heart. 
you want them to do that, but at the same time, you know that it sometimes takes its toll on them personally. I'm sure Lindsay has found that out as well in her work. Yeah. Well, thank you, you guys. I appreciated visiting with you. I am going to have to leave. I apologize. I'll have to leave at three o'clock today. I have another appointment I need to race across campus to get to. And since I don't quite know where I'm going, I'm going to give myself a little extra time. Well, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate your time. So we're going to move on to our um, state rep and our senator here today. Um, if it's OK with you, we've assigned a question to each one of you from our oil priorities. And so Mary, if you don't mind starting, um, we are asking you about direct care workers. Um, during COVID, there was some type of pay for those missing work due to COVID and that seems to have gone away. Uh, but the concern is that they're vulnerable workers because they are uh, predominantly people of color. And if they don't work, they don't get paid. So the question is, uh, is there an opportunity or possibility that that COVID funding or some type of um, sick leave pay is possible for these workers? So Angie, one of the dilemmas is we've got to have sustainable funding, not one-time monies. And that's, the, that's part of the problem. A lot of the COVID dollars are one-time dollars, right? And it's not an on ongoing solution to the problem of making sure those direct care workers have not only a decent pay and salary, because that's a lot, large part of it too. When you can go to Target and Amazon and all of these places and make $15 or more an hour, it's hard to keep good people and then attract that new workforce. So obviously, we have a lot of work to do there, and that's been an ongoing problem for quite some time. We get people trained, and then they leave. And you put all of that money into training somebody to take care of an individual or those individuals that are part of that contract, and then you no longer have them. So you're constantly training a new workforce. And that's where, again, I'm hoping this new um, Build Back Better plan includes what we need to be doing for ongoing services for our elderly and to be able to keep a stable workforce, pay them well, give them benefits, and to make sure that they've got retirement systems in place, um, sick leave, all of those things that we know are critical in keeping a good qualified workforce. But we have not treated these people like professionals and unfortunately, that's why we see such a high turnover rate and it needs to be addressed nationwide. It isn't a problem just here in Iowa or in our local counties. It is a nationwide issue and it has been for quite some time. I look at childcare in the same regard in terms of paying people well, making sure they have benefits and making sure we keep a well-trained workforce. And so those are the kind of things that I think are really critical right now. And of course, COVID has taken its toll on a lot of people and our direct care workers specifically because they are caring for those people in nursing homes. They're doing the outreach into home services. They're doing all of that. And at the same time, we don't treat them with the dignity and respect that they deserve. So Di Finley has been your champion and I know you recognize that name right away. Um, she's my go-to person uh, in terms of issues in the legislature whenever we're talking about direct care staff and what um, their needs are and then solutions. What are the solutions long-term to the problem that we're dealing with right now? And of course there are short-term solutions you know, using some of the COVID money for that purpose would be a short term, but it's not a long term solving the problem. And that's what needs to be done. And you will see Democrats supporting legislation to do that and continually advocating for those individuals who are caring for our elderly. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Mary?
Okay, we're going to move on, but if there are questions that come up later, feel free to put them in the chat, and Harrison is monitoring that, so we can circle back at the end and answer any additional questions. So thanks again, Mary. We're going to move on now to Dave. Um, we would like to hear your comments about livable homes and particularly the manufactured home crisis that's kind of bubbled up recently. Um, Len Sandler is a big advocate working on this issue locally. And the concern is, it's a very vulnerable population. The rates are going to increase. You know, what can we do about this? It impacts, you know, the poor population, the elderly, the disadvantaged. Um, what are your thoughts on that issue, please? Well, it's been a rather frustrating year and not getting anything significant done to help protect people in their homes, especially in our uh, manufactured home communities. And it's it, not only are we talking about people as they age out, we're talking a lot of, about a lot of people who are working, a lot of service workers, a lot of workers across the board. And it's uh, a little frustrating. I, I, the sticking point seems to be, and I hate to be blunt about it, the sticking point seems to be a well-funded lobbyist lobby who's fighting off any changes in manufactured housing or the owners. And it's rather sad. I, uh, I, I would think by <laughs> now we're hearing from a number of people and I'm hoping there's a little bit of an attitude change coming up in 2022 in the legislative session. But if people really support keeping people in their homes as long as possible, this is a key component that we make it affordable for people to stay in their homes. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Dave on this topic? I don't know if Len was able to stay on and yes, he is. Len, did you have anything you'd like to add? Just want to know what, how we can educate other lawmakers or bring this to their attention in a way that lets them recognize that there are lots of people in their districts. Because right now the network is pretty narrow and fatigued as well. I think there are probably 15 out of 600 parks and communities that are active in this. Well, Len, I my personal opinion is in a way you answered your own question. Uh, how do we move the needle? We really need people to be active in those districts and out, frankly, outside of Johnson County, maybe even outside of Lynn County. How can we get more people active in Calhoun County and Sac County in Worth County, you know, the counties where other people sit and they need to be able to actually see and feel the crisis that's going on right now. I think too many times for them, it's not real and it's miles away. So if there's some way, if you have ideas how we can uh, activate populations in the smaller areas and even, even one or two from the heart letters or emails to those individuals, to other legislature, legislators really does make a difference. Lynn, I'm gonna jump in too and just tell sure. you for the very first time, I have heard Republican legislators talking about affordable housing. I'm gonna repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> Republican legislators talking about affordable housing. And it's because the business community has stepped forward and said, we know affordable housing is one of the reasons why we are having a difficult time finding workers and keeping workers in our community. Our housing stock is really poor statewide and they're having a difficult time finding employees because they don't have housing in those local entities, especially if you're in a small town or a rural area. And again, we've got so much of that housing stock that has been in decline, whether it needs insulation or whether it needs a great deal of work 
in terms of making those homes livable and affordable just because the heating bills become so high if it's a home that has not been cared for well over a long period of time. My, you know, obviously mobile homes are a big part of that discussion because those are affordable and those are ones if we can find enough um, of that housing available and then landlords who treat people dis decently and don't increase the rents and rates dramatically over a year or two years. And that's what we're also seeing is that we've got a lot of those um, people who own those parks that are outside of the state. They're entities that don't have much of an investment in Iowa at all and don't seem to care about the people who are living there. Um, they make a few improvements and then they try to justify increasing the rent by a hundred or two hundred dollars and sometimes even more. So those are some issues. But to hear Republicans for the first time talk about affordable housing is somewhat of a bellwether and it also indicates that the business community is aware that this is a, a very definite problem in Iowa. And that it's so nice to get a little bit of positive feedback from Republicans on that. Personally, uh, having dealing with parents on both sides of the family, I'd like to know who the hell in 1920 thought putting the bathrooms up on the second floor was a good idea. If we ever find that architect or home builder, and if they're still with us, uh, I would like to have a conversation with him or her because it's also the home modifications we're directly and indirectly talking about too to keep people in their homes and keep workers in their home and keeping aging individuals in their homes. So, and it does cost a little money to move that bathroom downstairs if it's even possible in some homes. So uh, again, that's on a personal note. And, and if anyone knows who designed the homes, let me know. Thank you both, all of you, very much for your comments. Um, oh, did you want to say something, Kevin? I'm sorry to interrupt. Did you have a comment? I was just going to tell Dave that most of, a lot of those homes didn't have a restroom, and that's where the closet was that they could put them in. I'd be happy if it was a downstairs closet. <laughs> Dave, Dave, having bathrooms by your bedroom at night does make sense. What doesn't make sense is having the bedroom upstairs. Uh, you know, shortly after I came to Johnson County, uh, I visited a home. Uh, the bedroom was upstairs. The bathroom was upstairs. Uh, they have basically bumped on their bottoms going up and down the steps. Uh. So we'll just move on to our next question then. And this one is for Christina Bohannon. And we would like to um, hear your thoughts Christina, on the elder abuse issues. Um, it's been one of the oil priorities for a while now, and it doesn't seem to be gaining much traction. So if you could kind of speak to that legislative process and where things stand and um, your thoughts on that issue, that would be great. Sure, thanks. Hey, just quick on the on the manufactured housing thing. I mean, I wanna thank Lynn Sandler for all of his advocacy. He's um, he and I were in touch a lot last session about it, and he's done a lot of great work on that. Um, so thank him for that, and thank all of you for what you're doing on that. You know, I will agree with Mary. Um, so I was on judiciary where that bill came through, and um, I will say I agree with Mary that there is some Republican support for that, and including some fairly passionate support uh, for it uh, among uh, Republicans. You know, not enough yet. Um, but there are a few, including from some, I'll just say, very conservative <laughs> Republicans. So, you know, it's, it's interesting where that support comes from. So, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, I think we will see some some change on it. I don't know that it'll be this session. I, it's just I, I think it's a matter of time. But I think that there is some growing support for that. Um, and so, you know, we'll just 
have to hang in there and keep keep fighting. I mean, I think that um, uh, as as Dave said, you know, having people within uh, those districts uh, write to their representatives um, in you know around around the state. Uh, would be helpful, um, you know, writing op-eds and things like that when there are abuses or particular examples nearby that people can write about. And especially, as Mary said, you know, the fact that um, a lot of these owners are from out of state. And so essentially, you know, you have out of state companies that are really taking advantage of uh, Iowa citizens, and that's not okay. And so I think that, you know, calling that out in public, in forums and, um, you know, op-eds, things like that. I think that that would be really helpful because there is some support uh, for uh, doing something on that. And um, it's gaining national traction. Um, there was a piece, I think, the New Yorker or something about it um, a while back. You know, it's, it's gaining support, uh, but we just have to call it out enough that, you know, some legislators are willing to stand up to the lobby uh, on that. So um, anyway, but I, you know, it was actually one of the few bills in judiciary last time that, uh, we advanced, and even though we really didn't have the bill written or finalized, we didn't know exactly, but but there was enough support on judiciary to just push it through as almost like a, a template or a shell bill until we could get it worked out. Ultimately, it didn't happen, but you know, I think that there were people who were really trying to make it happen. So um, we just have to hang in there and keep going. And you know, I think eventually, uh, if, if we keep pushing, we'll, we'll get there. Um, but uh, anyway, so on to elder abuse. So, um, or elder abuse prevention, I always want to... I wanna, you know, say the prevention piece. Um, so um, I'm I'm working really hard on this bill. This is a bill that came through last year. Uh, it has a lot of support. It has a lot of support from a number, a very long list of organizations. I mean, I, I when I looked at the, the the lobby registry on this bill, I mean, it was amazing how many organizations and groups are supporting this bill. So um, you know, that's a really good start. Uh, it, it is, we need it because it's, um, it's really the only or the first bill that is, is a comprehensive elder abuse prevention bill that deals with um, uh, financial, emotional, and physical abuse. It's the one that deals with it, not only within like nursing homes and other kinds of institutional settings, but also just outside of those settings, generally speaking. Uh, it's it's a it provides criminal uh, enforcement, not just civil enforcement. So right now, what we have is kind of piecemeal. It's it, you know we have we have civil enforcement in places, or we have some you know um, actions against uh, you know nursing home providers, things like that. But we don't have a general comprehensive uh, elder abuse prevention bill that deals with all different kinds of abuse uh, by anyone in any setting. Uh, you know, and so that's why this is important. Um, I met with the attorney general's office just, um, I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks ago and um, wanted to learn more about you know, what they were seeing. Uh, this bill came out of uh, advocacy by, you know, a lot of groups like Older Iowans, um, but also from the AG's office because they were seeing a lot of abuses that they couldn't prosecute because they didn't have the support in the law to do it. Um, they didn't have the language they needed. They didn't have, uh, you know, the 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 um, you know statutory basis. And so, um, you know, for example, there, like I just said, there there were situations that weren't covered for outside a nursing home. There were situations um, that weren't covered if somebody took something from an older Iowan uh, and then used it for their child, like took money out of a bank account and used it for their child instead of using it for themselves. That wasn't uh, you couldn't prosecute that under the law, which is shocking and hard, so hard to believe, but it's true. And so um, the AG's office is looking at all those holes and places that they couldn't prosecute. And so they helped to draft this bill. Um, I think right now where we are is uh, there were uh, people on the Republican side who were worried about unintended consequences with this bill. And so, for example, they would point out a situation where uh, there was a family farm and uh, one uh, child uh, was basically taking uh, care of the family farm with her elderly parents. And that uh, child would use a vehicle or would use some kind of resources on the farm. And then uh, a sibling who wasn't very happy with, with the way that was being taken care of would go and complain that they were, you know, uh, uh, using up the assets or misusing property or something like that. Um, you know, they're, they're worried about unintended consequences of situations like that, where um, maybe someone's using property of the elderly person in a way that the person would have 
agreed to and would be kind of ordinary and maybe customary in a way. Um, but they're worried about, you know, having a bill that's so broad that it would, you know, unintentionally sweep in some of that conduct. And if there were siblings or other people who see that and complain about it, that somebody could get swept up in that. And so they're a little bit worried about those kinds of situations. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm talking to the AG's office to see if we can come up with language um, that will satisfy what the AG's office needs to prosecute the kinds of things that they're seeing that are the, you know, the, the really egregious behavior that we're trying to get at. Uh, but at the same time, not sweep in too much kind of unintended conduct or things that we think would have been fairly customary that someone would would agree to um, ordinarily. So um, there, you know, so I'm working on language with that. I'm trying to figure out some some uh, you know to, to see how we can how we can reward it maybe that would um, do what we want to do and not do what we don't want to do. So that's that's the key. Um, always looking for unintended consequences and trying to reword things you know in a way that that makes sense. So um, I'm working really hard on that. It's one of it's one of the two uh, bills that I'm working on um, pretty pretty closely and carefully myself um, to try to get it through this time. Um, and so you know I'm I'm going to keep keep consulting with the people. I'm, I'm supposed to talk to um, someone from AARP, um, I think in the next week or two as well to get their, their input on it so that I keep people in the loop as we go forward so we can end up you know somewhere that everybody agrees to. Happy to take Christina, questions. make sure you talk to Farm Bureau as well. They have okay. blocked a lot of this legislation and it seems okay. like we try to get down that road and then um, they at the very end say, no way. And um, it just seems like they should be brought in on the front end as opposed to the back end because they have been very good about blocking it in the past. Okay, that's a good thought. And, you know, and I do think um, just from my, you know, lawyerly perspective, um, there is some language in the bill that's a little squishy that, you know, I could see that they're pretty uncomfortable about, um, you know, just worrying about whether it goes too far or whether it's too vague or too subjective or something like that, that it could sweep in some stuff. That's kind of what I'm trying to deal with to see if there's a way to maybe use language that's already in code uh, somewhere instead of like a whole new language and see if there's some way to, to do that to make people more comfortable with that. But I think you're totally right. I mean, I, you're, Absolutely. And, and, the, and the examples that people gave as we were dealing with it last year, some of it did deal with farms and things. So I, I think that's, you're absolutely right about that. Thank you. One of the other things, Christine, I think that uh, uh, possibly if we take, uh, well, it was Senate file 522, I believe, uh, that we sent over to you guys, if we can even if we can have to start breaking it down and taking out and passing parts of it, let's get some of it passed because we keep, we keep uh, spinning our wheels on trying to uh, pass a comprehensive bill, uh, you know, and uh, I'm at the yeah. point where I'm going to try to take it and do it by piecemeal. Yeah, well, let's talk about that, Kevin. I, I hear what you're saying. And I, I mean, I think that's that the other bill I said, I was working on two bills. The other bill is exactly that. I took a piece off of something that couldn't pass last time and I'm just trying to get something done. On, so I, I, I appreciate that. I will say that I think there are some mixed views about that. Um, some people feel like what we really need is the comprehensive piece. And, and you know, so it, we're gonna have to work on that and see if people, you know, still support it. If we can, if we can only do pieces and you know things like that, it's kind of, kind of complicated. But I think, um, but you know, I, I there's so much support for this, and and so I, you know, I'm gonna try to stay optimistic that if we, you know, keep working on the language and try to make it something that's that's feasible and maybe pin it, you know, to something that's already in code instead of seeming like we're creating a lot of, you know, a new a new crime with a lot of additional language, maybe there's some way to do it. And, and there are some negotiation points, you know, um, for example, uh, one of the things in the bill starts the offenses at if somebody uses something that's $100 in value, if somebody takes something or uses something that's $100 in value, that is a serious misdemeanor. And so I don't know if it might be that we need to up those levels a little bit, right? Start it maybe at something that's a little higher in value. It, so it would only become a crime if if you um, if it was maybe a thousand dollars in value or something like that. I mean, I think that was another concern is that the thresholds here are very very low, um, and it might sweep in a lot of a lot of conduct that maybe um, isn't what's intended. So I don't know. There's there's some there are some different pieces to it. But um, but Kevin, I'd love to work with you on it. I I, I appreciate that offer. I. I definitely want to talk to you about it. 
politically the smart thing to do would be not send it back to the Senate. <laughs> so <laughs> if there's anything way we can get it through the House without sending it back, that would be best. That would be good. It's going to, I guess it has to go sometime. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got it out of our chamber. And, and I guess what I was looking at is if, if we couldn't get it through yours, maybe on our side, send some other bills or just parts of them uh, back over and to see if they'll accept anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's talk about that, Kevin. I, I, I'd i like to hear more about that. And like I said, just, you know, I had a, it was a really interesting conversation with the AG's office. They're, um, they have somebody there who's been working on this a long time. And I, it's clear that they're very frustrated without, with not being able to prosecute things and you know and so they're really trying to get this full thing through and I'm trying to explain the politics of the, the situation and so um, it's going to be a you know an ongoing process but look we've got a great draft a lot of people have spent a lot of time on it um, I, and I think we have some 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 places that we can start to negotiate some language and things like that so um, and I want to talk to the ARP again like I said too and um, Kevin I'll, I'll, I'm going to reach out to you and try to find a time that maybe we can we can talk sometime in the next few weeks before session. Yeah, well, I think that the whole thing is the AG's office is the one that actually introduced this, and it's politics. It's they don't want to take something that's from the Democratic AG. Yeah, Kevin, there's got to be other farm states that have passed legislation like this, though, and it seems to me that we ought to look to some of them that have been able to accomplish that even with Republican legislators and identify how they've went about it and, and helping us with uh, figuring out how we can get it done here. Well, putting it in a Republican's name and letting them run it. Right, right. Obviously that's a big part of it. And I'm sure that's what you did over in the Senate, right? Yeah, it is. Kevin, who, who was the who who was the Republican sponsor in the Senate? I don't remember. I just Oh, no, I was on the I was on the committee, but I don't recall. That's okay. We can talk about it later. Are there any other questions on this topic or should we move on? Are we ready to Thank you so much, Christina, for your input on that. We appreciate it and all of your hard work. So sure. it's really nice to be updated firsthand on what's going on with this bill. Thank you. And now we're gonna to move to Kevin. Your topic is long-term care ombudsman. So a couple of years ago, um, that budget line was cut and they weren't making visits. This was pre-COVID. Weren't making as many visits to long-term care facilities. And so we've, kind of been trying to make this more of a priority. Um, can you kind of give us some information on how that's going and what the future looks like for, for these um, in-person visits apart from the COVID restrictions? I, th I think we're gonna have to get back to in-person visits. Uh, right now, or it's, it's being done by phone. Uh, when you're doing any type of an investigation, uh, the best way to do that investigation is see those people in person, uh, not not over a, a phone. Uh, there has been a push trying to get the the alms budsmans back, but uh, we haven't uh, been very successful at that. Uh, there, uh, I, I think that uh, we're going to need to continue to get uh, pressure from uh, organizations uh, such as yourself. Um, and I really think we need to reach out to the law enforcement agencies that uh, the, they've got a lot of different lobbying groups up there. And if, and if we can make a case to them uh, that, that this is something that will uh, help uh, law enforcement, you know, it's more preventative uh, in, in, in a, a lot of ways than uh, it is uh, uh, pro, retroactively. But so it's, it's just something that we, we're going to have to continue to work on. I, it's very frustrating to me. Yeah, 
We have a question in the chat from Merce. Um, what is the opposition to having the ombudsman visits back to in-person? Cost. Cost, and then during COVID, they weren't letting anybody in to the nursing homes. They were trying to be extremely careful with making sure that they weren't bringing COVID in with others who didn't need to be there. You know, they weren't letting families visit. So during COVID, they've been really careful about who they will and won't let in. And I think that was a part of the problem too. We've actually gotten rid of the ombudsman before COVID. So uh, it did it. it it did make it worse or it was hard to, to advocate for it because of the COVID though. You're right about that, Mary. Yeah. I can't. I'm biting my lip on this one because it it has nothing to do with money because we are talking about uh, you know half a million dollars and when you're looking at a state budget that's uh, uh, sitting at about a billion above where we are sitting in a couple coffers uh, personally I think it's a, a, a whole different attitude coming through through uh, Department of Inspection and Appeals. And I think we're seeing uh, considerably less oversight in our homes that we, we really should be seeing. And strangely enough, the people you think would fight for it the most are not fight for in it as much as I would like to see. And that's inspections. Well, thank you all for your comments and your insights for us. Are there any other questions from the group or any other topics that we would like to discuss? And I open it up to all of our representatives. If any of you have a particular issue you'd like to share with us, please feel free to do that as well. One question that was discussed um, among the, the task force um, and Lindsay had to drop off, so I thought I'd kind of relay the thought and pose it to each of the representative senators. When it comes to advocacy, what is um, what stands out to you most as being most effective? Is it about being the squeaky wheel that gets grease? Is it about identifying the right legislator for the particular concern? Um, for each of you, what's most important when it comes to advocacy efforts? Well, I, I, I make it a point to answer any inquiries or letters or emails or texts that come my way uh, within 24 hours. And if it's something I need to get up to speed on, I will send, I will send a note to Harrison and say, hey, uh, let me find out some information on this. But I'll admit this too, if it's a very busy time of year, and sometimes you can get up to 100 emails or whatever in a short amount of time. Uh, I, will, I will look at it and say, District 74, I'm, I have to make sure I get back to every constituent first. And then if someone sends me an email from Sac City, Iowa, I will try to get back to them too. But it's a personal message, not a form letter. It's a personal message coming directly to you is what I read first. Uh, if it's a copied letter or a canned paragraph, then I still get back to people. In fact, ask, I usually ask them, tell me what your feelings are on this topic. You know, I appreciate the, the question or the opinion, but what's your feeling? But it really, uh, home is what matters. And I would just add that um, I think it's really critical to find someone in the majority party 
um, to sponsor your legislation because Kevin said it best. If you can find somebody who advocates for that within their caucus, then we have a much better chance of getting it through both chambers. Um, you can get a lot done in Des Moines if you don't care who takes credit for it. And a lot of times we don't. We don't care as long as we can move something forward that really and truly helps people. We don't really care who uh, sponsored it or led it or whatever. Um, you can get credit for it as well if you support it in final form and um, obviously advocate behind the scenes to get it done. Kevin's done a lot in the minority in the Senate. And Kevin, we can't thank you enough because you get things through that others can't because you work well with those Republican colleagues and they trust you. They, they certainly have a respect for your background as a law enforcement official. And then also um, just the fact that you're a farmer. Um, that gives you street cred that Dave and I don't have and Christina either. Um, we just, I mean, I grew up on a farm, but I don't have the same street cred you do because you do it now. And you are a part of that community. You're part of their thinking. And again, they respect you a great deal because of that. And I think those are the kinds of things we need to do more of is finding where we can find that common ground, support those individuals in their caucus who support our causes. And again, help them get that legislation through. And if you couldn't tell Kevin, that was Mary saying, yes, you are running again. <laughs> You already decided that, right, Kevin? <laughs> uh, yeah. Kevin, go speak to that, though, because you do a good job working with them, and you also know who to work with. Well, uh, it's just like that on, on so many of these issues. I think that if we, well, if we can do that, we can get some of it passed anyway. You know, it's no different than the bill that we were running last year that I was on, on investigating an elder, someone that's uh, being taken care of by a caretaker and, you know, and they, uh, and they're being abused by that caretaker and then they ultimately die. Now we can charge them with uh, uh, a homicide. Thank you again for all your comments. It looks like we are ahead of schedule here. So if there are, are no other topics to discuss, we can certainly end early. Um, but if there are additional questions, I'll give you one more opportunity to share your thoughts or whatever you'd like to talk about. I would like to uh, uh, just let the group know, I neglected to mention this earlier, we are holding a series of caregiver events, one in each of our counties, um, that's part of the use of our American Rescue Plan dollars. This is for formal and informal caregivers. So it's family members who are acting as caregivers, um, neighbors, but then also professional caregivers, folks that come into the home on a paid basis, and even those mail carriers who might notice that there's a client that hasn't picked up mail for a while and becomes concerned and follows up. Our, our goal is to really build a better foundation, a network of communication between all of these folks, getting the word out, sort of a who's doing what, who do we reach out to, how do we recover from the pandemic when caregiving has looked different, what do we need, just a really nice conversation between, between both professional and informal caregivers. Our first event will be by Zoom, and it will be on January 20th at 9 a.m. Um, it'll be about an hour and a half to two hours. Our, our initial plan was to have one big event face-to-face, -face, but then, you know, face-to-face -face possibilities looked a little different. So we're doing this first one by Zoom with the hopes of building this whole network and getting more names and more faces and more addresses, and then having a larger face-to-face -face event in the late spring, May or June, depending on the course of the pandemic, face-to-face, uh, -face, another uh, caregiving event in each county. So these are going to be very county centered, you know, the, the local 
our local networks and what do we do locally to take care of each other and our and our folks that are over 60. So wanted to make that date um, for all of you. It's January 20th at 9 a.m. by Zoom. We can get that Zoom link out to all of you. It'll be on our website as well. So we're looking forward to just continuing to, to build those outreach efforts. You know, it's just everything is getting that word out. And there's some real advantages to Zoom. It's convenient. You know, we didn't really plan it this way to begin with. We were just going to have one face-to-face, -face, but the Zoom's okay. People can do it if they're not comfortable leaving their home. They can do it from their living room couch. So I'm going to do that one, do it first that way, and then a face-to-face. -face. And Barb, is that one that, um, that's just for Johnson County, correct? Correct. That's the Johnson okay. County. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you are inviting legislators and other elected officials? If they would like to come, they're certainly invited to come and listen. Yes, we are. We do want to um, make sure that people are aware that we're having this event. And, and yeah, it is specifically aimed to caregivers, but anyone's welcome that might want from the legislator yeah. who might want to hear more about what's going on. Well, and I was thinking about city council and our county supervisors as well, mm -hmm. because yes. they have a lot of funding available for elderly services. And I think that's that's critical and it would be helpful for them to hear what is going on within the community and what the issues and concerns are. So I would recommend that you invite the elected officials from um, both the city and the county because I think they could benefit from that. And then I was just gonna end by saying thank you to all of you in terms of your advocacy. Um, you do a phenomenal job and you've got people in Des Moines that talk to us all the time about the issues that are, are so important to our elderly. And we listen to them. Um, I wish more of people did <laughs> because we'd get more done and be able to accomplish the things that we've been talking about today. But we do appreciate what you do and know that um, you are the front line in terms of the workers who are advocating for these services, for our elderly in our communities, and you are so vital um, to their best interest. And let's be honest, all of us hope to become elderly, right? Or we're there. And so the more you can do for them, you're gonna be doing for us as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. That was very nice. And thank you all again for coming today and sharing your insights and your ideas and your plans. And we really appreciate that you, you take the time out of your schedule for this each year. Um, it's very informative and we do appreciate you. And with that, I think we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays. <laughs>